And let me say that a demon like infidelity does not necessarily come in because a woman has been unfaithful to her husband. It comes in to make her unfaithful to her husband or a husband to his wife. We still hadn't finished and I made the next spirit name itself and it said death. And immediately I thought, could that be scriptural? And there came to my mind, Revelation 6, the horse whose rider was called death. And I realized that death is not just a condition, it's a personality. Now, I don't recommend talking to demons in a conversational way or consulting them, but it is scriptural to ask them questions and compel them to answer. And as I say, I'm not saying that everything I did was a pattern of what should be done. But I said to this spirit of death, when did you enter into this woman? And it said about three and a half years ago when she nearly died on the operating table. And later I checked with the woman, this was true. She'd had major surgery and almost died on the operating table. And I've learned since then that if a person has a major illness or a major operation, the spirit of death very frequently enters at that time. And a person who receives the spirit of death may well die without adequate physical grounds to cause death. And I have confirmed this since then with medical doctors who've been in this realm of experience. Well, we went against this spirit of death and ultimately it came out. As it came out, her face became like a death mask. There was not one shred of color anywhere in it. It was waxen, cold, and when the spirit came out, she was stretched on her back on the floor. And anybody walking into the room would have said instantly there was a dead woman on the floor. And I remember then how they said about the boy out of whom Jesus drove the epileptic spirit. They said he's dead, but Jesus said he is not dead and raised him up. The woman lay exhausted for about 10 minutes and then began to praise the Lord and speak in tongues. She had been speaking in tongues before and I had stopped her because God showed me that while she was speaking in tongues, the evil spirits couldn't come out. They couldn't pass that barrier. This isn't orthodox Pentecostal doctrine, but it just happens to be true. Uh, so that was it. Five hours, we felt the battle was won. Now, if this were to happen today, I would know immediately that such a woman would need follow-up and further instruction to, as to how to protect herself because Satan would certainly not leave her alone. However, we didn't know this. About halfway through the following week, she phoned my wife and me and said, I think some of them are trying to come back. Would you come out and see me? So we went out to her home and began to talk with her. And the youngest child, a girl of six, was there. A thin, unhappy, shy little child who never would look you in the eyes. No matter how you looked at her, she would not look you in the eyes. And she was graded at school, retarded. So after a little while, I said to this mother, I said, I know the devil is, doesn't always tell the truth. But when he said that they'd got your daughter, I think he must have been telling the truth. She said, would you pray for my daughter? I said, certainly we will. So she made an appointment and exactly one week later, the following Saturday, they came with this little girl of six. Approximately the same people were present, the Presbyterian brother and his wife. I don't think the Baptist minister was there the second time. And for about three or three and a half hours, we went through the same procedure with the little girl of six that we'd gone through with the mother. The evil spirits took over. They took charge of her countenance. They took charge of her gestures. And they spoke with their voice out of the little girl's lips. And I turned to the mother and said, is that your daughter's voice you're listening to? She said, it isn't even like my daughter's voice. Um, several of the same spirits that had been in the mother were in the daughter. Hate was one. I don't remember all of them, but I remember vividly the last one, again, was death. And when this spirit of death came out, the little child, like the mother, was stretched out on the floor, looking like a corpse. Now, I have not been able to follow up fully on that, but about two years later, that child was doing all right at school and was no longer graded retarded. There's this positive evidence of a change that took place. Well, this experience really, once and for all, opened my eyes. I saw the reality of evil spirits. I saw that they were exactly as they were portrayed in the New Testament, that they acted the same way, and that the New Testament way of dealing with them was the only really effective way. Now, I was preaching then to my congregation who were good Pentecostals, real good Pentecostals. And I began to look at my congregation in a new light. I saw things and forces at work in them that I'd never understood. So I thought they need deliverance too. 
And I began to kind of preach in a roundabout way about deliverance. Well, I'll tell you, it's no good preaching in a roundabout way. Never give hints as a preacher, because the wrong people always take them. You, you give a hint about being too noisy, and the one that's noisy doesn't listen, but the little shy, mousy woman that never would open her mouth is squelched forever, you see? If you've got anything to say to an individual, say it to the individual, not to the group. That's just by the way. Well, when I began to talk about deliverance for Pentecostal people, they sat back with an indulgent sort of smile on their face and thought, our pastor's got to be in his bonnet, but he's helped us, and he'll get over it. And who knows what would have happened? But one Sunday morning in the worship service, I had chosen as my text, Isaiah 59, 19, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Now, I was not aware of it, but a tape was being made of this message and is preserved and I have it today so I can, it, everything I say can be verified from the tape. And I didn't hear the tape till about six months later. And I was interested to hear myself because I realized about after about 15 minutes of preaching, the Holy Spirit began to take control of me in an unusual way, and I began to say things that I hadn't planned to say, and furthermore, my voice changed. I mean, I, I listened to myself with interest, and I became unusually bold in my preaching. My theme was that no matter what the devil does, God has always got the last word, and God began to bring things to my mind. I said, Egypt had their magicians, God had his Moses. Baal had his prophets, God had his Elijah. And then the thought was brought to me that when God wanted to show Abraham what his seed would be like, he took him out in the dark night and showed him the stars of heaven and said, so shall thy seed be. And I said to these people, now we are the seed of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ, and we're like the stars. When all the other lights are shining, you don't see the stars. But when every other light has gone out, then the stars shine brighter than they've ever shone before. And this is how it's going to be at the close of this age, when every other light has gone out. The seed of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ are going to shine like the stars. Well, it's interesting to know the messages the devil doesn't like. And I'll tell you, that one is at the top of his list. And I just got to this climax, and the most unexpected thing happened. Sitting on the front pew on my left was a lady who came every Sunday morning specifically to play the piano. Now, she was the daughter of a Pentecostal pastor. She was married to a Pentecostal Bible student. Her brother-in-law was a minister. She had grown up in Pentecost, known salvation, the baptism of the Holy Spirit from her earliest years. She was a test case. And as I reached this point in my message, she let out a prolonged blood-curdling shriek. And this is recorded on the tape, so there's no need to exaggerate about it. Threw her arms up in the air and slumped to the floor in a very unladylike attitude. And here I was, I just preached, no matter what the devil does, God has got the last word. So I either had to prove it or stop preaching. That was where I was. So I intended to prove it. I'll tell you, I didn't feel like backing down for one moment. But I thought I needed a little help. So I looked across the congregation. I saw my wife. I knew I could count on her. And I thought, well, maybe we need one or two more. And I looked at my good Pentecostal church members. And honestly, there was not one of them that could say boo to a demon. But the Presbyterian couple who'd been with us in the two previous battles were there, and I knew they knew what it was all about. So I said, will brother, sister, so and so come out, help us? And the four of us gathered around this woman, still writhing and moaning on the floor. And this Presbyterian lady, I always remember her, when it came to demons, she was like a terrier after rat. She didn't wait for anything. She started to jump up and down, and she said, now you spirit that's in this woman, what is your name? And out of this woman's voice, there came a uh, throat, there came a harsh, gruff, masculine sounding voice, which said, my name is, but wouldn't say anymore. Well, I always need somebody to get me going. So I thought if the Presbyterian lady can do it, I can do it. So I stood in front of this spirit and I said, now in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm speaking to you and not to the woman. What is your name? I said, my name is, but wouldn't say anymore. So I said, you have to answer me. You're subject unto me. And after a little of this psychological warfare, it suddenly said, my name is lies. And it said it so loud that everybody in the church went up and down, came down with a bump on the so You could have heard it outside the church. And I said to myself, that's scriptural. First Kings chapter 22, a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets of Ahab. I said, you lying spirit, in the name of Jesus, come out of this woman. And then began 10 minutes of the most intensive struggle I think I can ever recall in my life. Spiritual, mental, physical. It was total warfare. This thing defied us. It refused to come, but I knew it had to. And after about 10 minutes, it came out of this woman with a loud, prolonged, sustained roar like an express train going past. And as it came out, the woman's tongue was protruding out of her mouth, 
bluish in color and twisting like a snake. And when the spirit had gone, the roar subsided and the woman fell to the ground like an emptied sack. And I knew the spirit had gone, but I also knew there were more. God was so good to give me a few private runs before I got launched in public. Otherwise, I'd have made a fool of myself and said, praise the Lord, our sister is delivered. She was delivered at that. But I knew instantly from what I felt inside me, there was a lot more. However, I thought that was enough for the morning worship service. So I said uh, to the church treasurer, who happened to be on hand, I said, now, if you'll take our sister into the office, I'll continue with my sermon. So the church treasurer and the Presbyterian brother marched the lady off into the office. And I went back to the pulpit. Well, I tell you, I was preaching at round eyes and open mouths. And I never had to argue with that congregation again about demons. There just wasn't any argument left. Well, my wife went in with the lady. And after a little while, only a few moments, I heard dull thuds coming out of the office. And my wife put her head around the corner of the door and said, you better come in here quickly. And I knew my wife wasn't given to panic. So I realized something was going on there that needed my presence. So I said to the people, well, I think I'll close my sermon and you can either stay in the church and pray or go home, whatever you feel like. So I got down off the platform to go into the office and the mother of this woman that had made this strange display, a very godly saintly woman walked up to me and she said, Mr. Prince, was that our daughter? And you know, I didn't know how to answer her. I thought it must have been. There was only one person sitting on that seat, but the whole countenance and behavior of the woman had changed so completely I didn't dare to say yes. I said, I think it must have been. There was no one else sitting there. She said, may I come with you into the office? I said, by all means. So she and her husband, the girl's father, came in. Then the husband of the girl was there. He came in. Well, when we got in the office, it was, a, it was not like it should have been in a pastor's office. The girl was being held one on each arm by the church treasurer and the Presbyterian brother. And every time she got a hand free, she was just tearing her clothes off. And if she couldn't tear her clothes off, she was tearing other people's clothes off. And when I saw this scene, I thought to myself, this is where Pentecostal preachers get into trouble. So I said to the family, husband, father, and mother, I said, now, if you'd like to take this young lady to a psychiatrist, that's perfectly all right by me. But I will do nothing more unless you all assure me that you want me to handle this case. So they all said instantly, we'd like you to handle it. Well, I said, in that case, I think everybody except my wife and the members of the family and myself should leave the office. So they did. Well, then the mother of the girl began to tell me that she'd been seeking to make an appointment for some time to get counseling for the girl and her husband because their marriage had begun to take a very strange turn. And I don't want to go into the details, but a, the woman was a nurse and she was able to express these things very correctly. A strange type of perversion was developing between this woman and her husband, which was totally unlike what you'd imagine a Pentecostal couple would get involved in. And then it transpired. I would, then I began to think, well, I'll pray again, and I couldn't. And then it transpired that this young woman was infatuated with her brother-in-law, her husband's brother, and that they were exchanging letters, which could have a perfectly good meaning or could have a somewhat different meaning. And that she had one of these letters addressed to her husband's brother in her purse at the time. Well, I said immediately, now this is sin. And if you will not renounce it as sin, I will not pray for you because I cannot pray for you if you intend to keep up this relationship. And I said, if you will renounce it, you'll give me that letter in your purse and I'll tear it up in front of you. Well, it took 10 minutes to convince that woman that she had to do this. She handed me the letter and I tore it up and dropped it in the waste paper basket. Then I thought, now really, if she's a woman, it would be better if my wife were to pray with her. But somehow God showed me very clearly, this is your job. I put my hand on the woman, and as soon as I touched her, she slumped to the floor in a sitting position. And then again, in a way that I cannot explain, the Lord showed me that there was only one position of her body in which this woman could receive deliverance, and that was with her body pressed forward and her head between her knees. So I put my hand on the small of her back and pressed her body forwards. Something like, well, I would say almost like being in the delivery room of a maternity ward. And... Uh, now, this will sound extraordinary to some people, but I began to command the evil spirits to come out, and they came out, one after another, naming themselves. And some of them had very unclean sexual names. And this is the thing. As they came out of her body, each one registered against the palm of my hand. I could, it's like, I don't know if you've ever seen people dropping airline tickets in, and there's a little beep as each airline ticket goes in, and they count them at the gate, and there's a record. Well, it was just like that. It was like a sort of electronic record in my hand each time a, Spirit went past. Now, I had no theories about this, but it was clear and definite. Now, this happened around about noon, 
And around about two o'clock in the afternoon, so far as I was able to judge, the last spirit went out. And when it did, the woman was totally exhausted. She was absolutely like a rag. She just slumped limply onto the floor and lay there for about 10 minutes, then put her arms up in the air and began to praise the Lord for deliverance. So far as I know, that woman was delivered, as far as I'm able to understand. But I tell you one typical and sad thing. She never returned to that congregation. She was too ashamed to come back. And to me, this seems to be such an indictment of the church. We're so respectable that when people really get into trouble, they can't come to us. And I'm convinced this is true again and again of the Christian church in the United States. It's like a middle-class club. That's about what it is. And the people that really often need help the most just wouldn't dream of coming to that kind of a place to get help. Well, after that, I never had to convince my congregation that spirit-baptized Christians could have evil spirits. And from then on, my wife and I were launched into a new phase of ministry. We didn't choose it. It just was like an explosion. It was like an avalanche. People came from everywhere. And most of them did not come to the church. They came to our home. How they knew we were there, it's hard to say. But for week after week, we never went to bed before about two or three in the morning. We had people in our home counseling and praying with them. Now, as a result of this, my own physical strength began to break down, and I got a very serious lesson that if I didn't watch my own strength and spiritual condition, I wouldn't be in a position to deliver anybody. I'd need deliverance myself. And also, I began to see that this was really not a practical way to handle the situation. I soon discovered that the basis for getting a person delivered is proper instruction out of the Word of God, and that to give a person the instruction they needed would take probably about an hour. To pray with them would take, say, another 30 minutes. In other words, each individual took an hour and a half. So if you took 30 people a week, that was 45 working hours, which by modern standards is a working week. And furthermore, it was extremely uh, wearing physically for the people doing it. So I didn't quite know what to do, but the Lord gradually showed me that this isn't necessary. As a matter of fact, I really cannot recall exactly how I got into it, but I found myself preaching on deliverance, calling people forward and instructing them how to receive deliverance, and then seeing them delivered without all this individual counseling and praying. I remember vividly one of the first situations in which this really happened was the International Convention of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship in Chicago in 1965 in the Conrad Hilton Hotel. And I was doing the afternoon Bible teaching each afternoon for five days. And uh, one day I taught on deliverance. There were about 600 people in the Bible class. And at the end, I made one appeal for those who felt they might need deliverance. And immediately 200 people put up their hands at a minimum. I called them forward and I found 200 people standing in front of me needing deliverance. And I thought, what do I do now? And it really was at that point that I saw that if I gave them the correct instructions and prayed a general prayer, it, they could get their own deliverance. And many did. I can still meet people over the United States who say, I got delivered in that service in the Conrad Hilton Hotel in 965. But I'll have to admit it was a chaotic scene. There were a couple of epileptics that fell to the floor and were frothing. And there were women screaming, and some women just rushed out in panic and went up to their hotel rooms and decided they wouldn't come down again as long as I was preaching. So I have to agree with my critics, of whom there have been some, that it wasn't the standard type of service. And really, I suppose the Conrad Hilton Hotel isn't really the place for that sort of thing. We had another instance of deliverance in those meetings the last afternoon when I didn't preach on deliverance. We got landed with a young woman, and again, this was a five-hour case. And I did not count, but a lady who was present counted and wrote down the names of 72 different spirits that named themselves and came out of this one girl. Now, we know this girl today. She's a friend of ours. She's living for God. This is not just a temporary flash of emotionalism. She's a trained nurse. She's not the type of person who's ignorant or couldn't express herself or could be misled as to what was happening. And uh, some of these spirits that came out of her were fantastic. For instance, there was one that was the spirit of fetishes that understood Swahili, which I spoke from East Africa. The girl had never been near East Africa, didn't understand a word of Swahili. This spirit knew everything about East Africa that was needed to know. See, it could name politicians and answer questions and so on. So in many ways, I got objective proof of the validity of this thing. 
And uh, then I began to think, well, is it right to do it in public? It embarrasses some people. Some people don't feel it's appropriate to a church service and so on. But I began to study the ministry of Jesus. And it was made very clear to me that Jesus regularly did this in the synagogue. He taught and then he cast out demons in all the synagogues of Galilee. And they were not quiet. They screamed. They threw people on the ground. They frothed at the mouth. They identified him as the son of God and so on. It wasn't done in that decorous, seemly way that some people like to associate with a synagogue or a church. There was plenty of action. But I said to myself, and I still say that today, if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. As far as I'm concerned, I have no ambition to improve on the methods of the Lord. If I can attain to that, that will be my ambition satisfied in that respect. And uh, I can only praise God that in the years between then and now, Without exaggeration, I have seen thousands of people delivered from evil spirits, and I have written testimonies from those who must number well over a hundred, all sorts of persons, physicians, lawyers, teachers, attorneys, not ignorant, emotional, unstable people who don't know what they're talking about, who cared enough without my ever pressing them to, to write down and express what deliverance meant and to express their gratitude to God and also to me for receiving deliverance. And I will say this, of all the torments that people endure today, there is no torment, in my opinion, that equals the mental and spiritual torments that demons inflict on people. And if you want to have some idea of what it's like, go to a mental institution. I, I actually hate to think inside me what it's like to be inside the doors of one of those places. I've gone to those places, ministered to people, but it's very, very hard to minister when a person's under psychiatric or medical care. You cannot cross swords with the psychiatrist. We had a woman in the meeting here the night we had the potluck supper and the baptismal service. The last time I saw her, she was in a mental institution in the state of North Carolina, and her husband took me to see her and said that she was apparently a hopeless case. And I do not remember what I said to her, but I told her the root of her problem. And she came here that Saturday night about four weeks ago and said, I want to thank you for telling me the truth. You're the one who helped me. That's why I'm out, because you told me the truth about myself. And when I faced the truth, I got out. And she's been out for two or three years now. So these are facts about this. Now, I would like to go back to scripture just in closing this message. And I want again to line this up with the book of Joel, which as I've said in other studies, I believe is, a, is an outline of this latter day visitation of the Holy Spirit. I've said in previous studies, the theme of Joel is desolation, restoration, and judgment. And the desolation is the desolation of the entire inheritance of God's people. And, uh, one day when I was meditating on this ministry and what it had brought me into, God asked me this question. He said, you've preached on the desolation of the inheritance of my people many times. He said, did you ever stop to think what caused that desolation? And I said, no, Lord, but I've got it right now. It was an invading army of insects. And the Lord said to me, my people have been systematically invaded by the forces of the enemy, and these are demons. It's not an accident. It's part of Satan's strategy. And one of the great end products of the present move of the Holy Spirit in the church is to drive out Satan's fifth column from inside the church. And the church will never be able to function as God designed it to function while it has a fifth column inside it. And what is true of the church collectively is true of believers individually. You cannot be the kind of Christian that God could make you when you have something inside you taking away your peace, fighting against what is true and good, disturbing and tearing down from within. You may have outward victory. You may be able to lead a decent Christian life. You may be able to suppress this thing. But remember one thing, God's solution is not suppression. It's deliverance. Lots and lots of Christians are suppressing something that shouldn't be there. They make a good job of suppressing it, but it isn't God's solution. Now look at the picture here in Joel 1.4. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. That's the invading army. 
And the result of the invasion is summed up at the end of verse 12. Joy is withered away from the sons of men. And that's what demons do. A Christian cannot have deep, settled, abiding inner peace and joy while the enemy is there, like an insect nibbling away at the fruit of the Spirit. Restoration is described in Joel 2.25. I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I send among you. This is the promise of restoration. It comes in direct association with the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the close of this age. And notice the summation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The climax of what is achieved by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Joel 2.32, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. God has shown me that part of my ministry is not to pray for everybody individually, but to instruct people how to meet God's conditions so that they can call on the name of the Lord and receive deliverance direct from God for themselves. And this is in direct line with Scripture. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now let me just state in closing four results in my own personal life and experience which I have traced from being brought into this ministry. First of all, I have proved afresh the accuracy and reliability of the Scriptures. Demons are just the way they're described. They behave the same way and they need to be treated the same way and it works. It's not uh, a medieval superstition. It's not ignorance. The Lord didn't put himself down on the level of people of his day because he didn't know better and they didn't know better. This is exactly the way it is and it's exactly the same today as it was in the New Testament. It's a fact. Secondly, God showed me many times through helping others my own need of personal watchfulness and holiness in an altogether new way. So many times I realized how people yielding to moods like anger, bitterness, resentment, self-pity had opened the way for evil spirits. God showed me how I had to cover my own life. And I'll tell you, I may not be the kind of Christian I ought to be, but I am much closer to the Lord today than I was when I first moved into this ministry. I've covered up many, many gaps in my armor. Thirdly, I have understood in a new way the significance of the cross. In the spiritual world, denominations, month and nothing. Labels are of no importance. All that matters in the spiritual realm is what Christ did on the cross. His shed blood, his death, his resurrection, and what that means for the believer. And fourthly, I have to praise God and give him the glory that I have been able to help literally thousands of people whom I could not have helped until God showed me these truths which I have been sharing with you.